In this video, we're going to be talking about the various energy pathways and which one's the primary energy pathway based on the duration of exercise during intense exercise. All right, so um, looking at this figure here, we have uh, time on the x-axis. In this, uh, this x-axis is not uniform across. So um, we go from three seconds to 15 seconds to 60 seconds to 120 seconds, and then jumping all the way to two hours. So this is not a uniform linear timeline here. Keep that in mind. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have energy production rates, so how quickly we are producing energy in the exercise performance level. All right, so. Uh, looking at these lines, we have uh, this dotted black line is the actual exercise performance level. And then these various lines represent the different sources of ATP production or, or availability. Um, and so I'm going to be linking this figure to this table, which kind of summarizes the, the key points. All right, so the first one to three seconds is going to be primarily using are stored up ATP. So this is ATP that was produced before that was just sitting and available in our muscles. So we burn through that with intense exercise in between one and three seconds typically. Um, after we start burning through that, we need to immediately replace that energy. And so we do that with phosphocreatine. So when this um, a source of energy, so the, the, the available stored ATP starts to run low, we switch to phosphocreatine. So from three seconds to 15 seconds, that, that period of time, that epoch, um, which that's what epoch means is the period of time, is going to be primarily fueled with phosphocreatine. So looking at the figure here, we can see it ramps up immediately as the, the green line is going down, which is the stored ATP line. And it stays high up until around 15 seconds where it pretty quickly diminishes. And that's when we start running out of phosphocreatine. And anytime we run out of an energy source, we have to then transition to the next energy source. Um, and so the next energy source is going to be glycolysis. And we're specifically talking about glycolysis here that is going to end in um, uh, lactate. So it's an anaerobic style glycolysis, not glycolysis ending in pyruvate that will go into arrhythmic metabolism. We'll get to that, but we're not there yet. So here is our um, glycolysis line. It ramps up as the, our phosphocreatine line quickly ramps down and becomes the dominant energy pathway. Keep in mind, I'm talking about dominant or primary energy pathways. None of these are active by themselves and 100% in charge of sort of fueling exercise. They're all active all the time. It's just which one is the dominant because they do kind of hand off um, that primary role. Anyways, so as we switch from phosphocreatine, which is a immediate, really fast energy source to glycolysis, exercise intensity has to come down because we can't produce energy as quickly with glycolysis as we could with phosphocreatine. And um, as we sort of transition even further, so glycolysis, um, anaerobic glycolysis is going to be the primary energy pathway for 15 to 45 seconds. Um, after 45 seconds, it's going to be a steady shift from anaerobic glycolysis to aerobic glycolysis, uh, where we're gonna start ramping up our, uh, our Krebs cycle and our electron transport chains and using that pyruvate that is the end product of glycolysis whenever we have aerobic metabolism being active. And we are quick, we're going to be shifting again from anaerobic to aerobic energy um, during the next, um, you know, minute or so here. So from 45 seconds to 120 seconds. Um, giving an example here at the 60 second time point, uh, which is right here on our figure, about 70% of the energy is coming from anaerobic style glycolysis and about 30% of the energy is coming from aerobic metabolism, primarily coming from glycolysis and using up the pyruvate as the end product of glycolysis, again, through the, the aerobic pathways. Going out to 120 seconds, so going from one minute to two minutes here, this is the point where aerobic metabolism and anaerobic metabolism cross each other. So we um, are now using 50% anaerobic and 50% aerobic metabolism at two minutes, um, keeping in mind that the aerobic metabolism is still primarily uh, using the end products of glycolysis, so the pyruvate and the um, various uh, electron carrier molecules that can come from that process in order to fuel the aerobic metabolism. As we go beyond 120 seconds, so beyond two minutes, we are primarily using aerobic metabolism, and it's going to be a mixture of fat and carbohydrates. 
Higher intensities are going to be favoring carbohydrates. Lower intensities will be favoring fats. Um, so it'll be a mixture of the two. Um, but if we're talking about higher intensities, primarily still carbohydrates up until about two hours where most people start to run out of carbohydrate stores and are forced to use a lot more fat. You know, this is that point where in a marathon, people talk about hitting the wall around two hours. That's because that's when they're running out of carbohydrates. And looking at this exercise performance line here, each time we do a handoff and we're progressing down these various energy pathways, exercise performance is going to suffer. It's going to go down further and further. So let's talk about why that is exactly. I've already kind of mentioned it, but let's show it a little more concretely here. Um, so this figure has phosphocreatine, glycolysis, which is ending in lactate, so it's the anaerobic style glycolysis, glycolysis, and ending in pyruvate that goes into the aerobic pathways. Um, so aerobic glycolysis, and then we have aerobic fat metabolism here. And we have two different lines. We have a purple line, which represents the energy liberation rate. So how quickly we can get energy out of that pathway. And we have the green line here, which is the total energy available in that energy pathway. All right. So uh, looking at the bullet points here and kind of lining all this up, phosphocreatine is an immediate energy source. We can produce a lot of energy really, really quickly. So we pull a lot of energy out really, really quickly, but there's very little energy in our muscles that is stored as phosphocreatine. So even though we can make energy really quickly this way, we just don't have a lot of it. So we're going to run out of it really quickly. All right, so going to anaerobic style glycolysis, this is also pretty quick. It's not nearly as fast as phosphocreatine, but it's still pretty quick. Um, and so our, our ability to get energy out of it, again, happens quickly. And this looking at the purple line here. It's still not a ton of energy there though. We, we're gonna quickly run out of our ability to run anaerobic glycolysis. So as we build up um, our lactate and uh, build up acid levels in our blood and our muscles, we are forced to slow down and we're able to use glycolysis more aerobically. We can fuel our bodies though for about two hours on aerobic style glycolysis. Um, so most people who are highly trained runners who are running marathons, most of that race is going to be uh, using aerobic style glycolysis. So again, up to about two hours. Um, the speed of energy coming out is going to be much less than if we're uh, running glycolysis faster and doing it anaerobically, and certainly much less, uh, much slower than phosphocreatine. But the total energy we can get out of it is obviously much greater than what we can through anaerobic glycolysis or phosphocreatine. Um, moving on here to fat metabolism, uh, so aerobic fat metabolism, because all fat metabolism is done aerobically. Um, this is a much slower process, so the speed of energy liberation is much slower than everything we've talked about up to now. So you can see this purple line just kind of marches down downward. However, how much energy, the total energy we have available to us that we can pull out of these systems is marching upward as we go down you know, to the right and towards that aerobic metabolism here. And in fact, a normal individual who is well fed, um, who's not in like a starvation uh, state, they're going to have enough body fat to do nearly limitless amounts of exercise. Now, of course, someone can overdo exercise and run into problems, but you know, assuming that they're well trained, they're well fed, they're being uh, maybe even fueled along the route, somebody can exercise for hours, days um, using fat metabolism. So think about ultra marathon running. People will literally run for days at a time, you know, stopping to sleep maybe a couple hours here or there if they need to. And so aerobic fat metabolism, huge amounts of energy a bit available. It's just very slow to come out. Right, so clearly there's a difference between the types of activity that's going to give us uh, a lot of aerobic metabolism versus the types of activity that's going to be more anaerobic metabolism. And then, you know, everything in between, there's, there's various ratios of the two. Um, so let's look at um, some examples here. Uh, so aerobic versus anaerobic energy contribution on the, on the, on the y-axis here, we have percentage of the total energy used for the activity that is either aerobic, the green line, or anaerobic, the purple line. And we have 
the duration of that activity on the x-axis. So we've seen some of these types of numbers before. So one to three seconds, think about, you know, Olympic style weightlifting or powerlifting, very quick activities, you know, a few seconds long typically or less. Um, those are going to be almost entirely anaerobic and almost no aerobic energy being used. As we increase the duration here, so as the duration of time becomes longer, we use more aerobic and less anaerobic energy. Um, and to the point around two minutes where the two cross each other, which we've already kind of talked about on the previous slide. Um, but at that point in time, it's 50-50 aerobic, anaerobic. Beyond two minutes, it's more aerobic than anaerobic. Um, so looking at a few um, examples that are typically right around that crossing point would be like an 800 meter run, maybe boxing. And once we get past that, maybe a 1600 meter run or a mile run, um, 2000 meter rowing, um, going a little further out, more, even more aerobic and even less anaerobic. 5k uh, running, uh, whether it's cross country or track or uh, road running, um, you know, cross country skiing, even further out up to about two hours or so, marathon running, various other activities as well. Much of that is going to be aerobic and very little anaerobic at that point, just because it, we just can't be anaerobic and maintain it for that duration of time. So the longer the duration, the more we're going to be favoring aerobic, the shorter the duration or the higher the intensity of exercise, the more we are going to be favoring anaerobic energy. Um, if, the energy well, if the exercise is very intense and um, we try to push it beyond a short duration, we're gonna run out of energy in each pathway and be forced to slow down with fatigue as I showed a couple of slides back um, with the, the sort of handoff that happens from phosphocreatine to glycolysis to more aerobic glycolysis to eventually in fat metabolism, which is also aerobic. So we talked a lot about different energy pathways and anaerobic versus aerobic energy sources and hinted a little bit at the difference between when we're using carbohydrates versus fats. But in the next video, I'm gonna be going into even more detail of when we're using fats, when we're using carbohydrates. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a link to that video in the description below this video.